Good morning and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're going to start this uh, morning's meeting with the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have one announcement in addition to our calendar, and that is on Friday of this week, December 18th. We will be having a board meeting starting at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. The topic of um, the meeting will be FY21 ACO budget discussion, and that will be posted on our website momentarily if it hasn't already. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 9th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Jess to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 9th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. So the next item on our business this morning is a discussion on the Medicare benchmarks. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh to lead that discussion. Sarah. Good morning. Please uh, allow a moment for the sharing to start. And I can see it. I'm usually the last one to be able to see it. So are others seeing that? We are. Wonderful. Okay. Good morning. My name is Sarah Lindbergh. I work for the Green Mountain Care Board and head up the data team. And I come before you to uh, pro for a recommendation on a proposal for the 2021 benchmark for the uh, ACO participating in our all pair model agreement. So just to level set, uh, there are different financial targets at play when we're talking about the all pair model. Uh, we, today, we are not talking about those that are in the all-payer model agreement. That's a statewide agreement between the state of Vermont and the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and that is a gross target between 2017 and 2022 um, between the range of 3.5 and 4.3%. So that's a whole different cookie that we're not going to be munching on today. Today, we're going to talk about the Medicare Participation Agreement. So this is a contract between Medicare and the ACO. In, in our case, we have one, which is One Care Vermont. And our job under the agreement is to set annual prospective targets, also known as benchmarks, for the spending of the beneficiaries who will be attributed to the ACO in 2021 or whichever year we're talking about. So benchmark, we use that word a lot. So this again is the ACO's financial target for what we call a performance year or PY. Um, there are five performance years in the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Agreement, which I will call the agreement or the APM agreement. And again, that is between the state of Vermont, the whole state and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS. And they also refer to them as CMMI, which is a, a subunit for innovation under CMS. According to the agreement, the GMCB each year must propose these benchmarks before the performance year starts. So they are prospective in nature. And CMS might, may either approve our proposal or request revision. Um, again, these targets are a contractual agreement between the ACO and CMS. It's not the 3.5% that we talk so much about in the agreement at large nor is it the all-inclusive population-based payments or AIPBP mm -hmm. under the Medicare agreement. Can I pause you right there, Sarah? I, I did receive a text from someone saying that they're not seeing the uh, slides. I'm seeing them quite clearly. Are others having trouble seeing these slides? Not here. Not I, can, here. I can see them. I'm fine. Okay, they are so also maybe. available on the website if that helps that individual or I could. Yeah, if they could just go to the website, it's got to be a problem on their end. So, you know what, we'll um, share the link to the slides on the website in the chat. Thank you. OK, um, so the AIPBP or those all inclusive population based payments are totally different than these financial targets and the benchmark. 
Um, that is not necessarily true for the Medicaid program. So just remember that Medicare is a different animal than Medicaid. So the AIPBP for Medicare is a means for making the revenue more stable and consistent. And essentially what happens is for people who elect to get these prepayments, uh, the federal government looks at what Medicare has historically paid that provider for a year and tries to divide it up into 12 equal chunks for the whole year. And that makes the, the revenue more consistent and stable. However, those payments will be reconciled to the actual care that was sought by the people attributed to the ACO. So they see um, what care the provider actually did provide and figure out what Medicare would normally have paid um, under the fee-for-service business-as-usual schedules. So those reconciled amounts are the ones that we are talking about when we're talking about the ACO's total cost of care or otherwise known as their financial performance under the model. So as you can see, 2020 um, had quite a big difference between that AIPDP, the top line, and the fee-for-service equivalents. So um, some of this um, between March and September, a goodly portion of this will be um, luckily um, eligible for reimbursement through the stimulus funding. <clears throat> but under a normal year, this is exactly the kind of um, risk, if you want to call it that, or um, reconciliation that might be of a concern to providers. Um, they would rather not have to worry about paying this money back. And, and that's, in fact, why Medicaid is different and likely more attractive to a lot of providers. I will say that this is um, incurred through August and paid through November. But um, as you can see, that little bit of a nosedive between July and August, that is because um, UVMMC was uh, not able to submit claims uh, due to the cyber attack. So we're still waiting for them to catch up. Um, so everything we're looking at is a little bit distorted. Um, normally three months of run out, um, we would feel a lot more confident about, um, but we're just kind of waiting for them to catch up. So as far as the agreement between Medicare and OneCare, uh, OneCare will have a total cost of care, which is the actual spending that will occur for beneficiaries who are attributed to them for the performance year. So what happens is we figure out all the, the fee-for-service uh, payments that Medicare makes for those folks, and then we figure out um, the amounts that were prepaid through the AIPBP. Eh, A -I -P -B -P. First, to whoever came up with that acronym, it just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> um, so again, this means that you know even though I'm attributed to one care um, because my primary care relationship appeared to be in Vermont, um, any care I were to receive in New Hampshire or Florida or any old other place that Medicare pays for is going to be included in this. So it's not just the care delivered by the ACO. Um, the prepayments through the AIPVP would only be in the network because they're the ones who elect to be paid in that way. So what happens is they figure out how much the ACO's beneficiaries spent, compare that with their financial target. And that's how we determine whether the ACO is eligible for shared savings or losses. It's important to keep in mind that this comparison only happens at the ACO level. Any reconciliations underneath that are the ACO's responsibility. So how they distribute that through their network is not um, what Medicare is up to. Their relationship is at the ACO level. And so uh, here's an example benchmark. So in this case, um, if we said the, the target for spending was $100, in the middle you see that risk corridor. In this case, it's a plus or minus 5%, but that, that could be any, any um, uh, approved uh, amount of risk. And so if uh, the ACO spending was 90, uh, the, the ACO would get the $5, the $5 between uh, 195 and CMS would keep the additional $5. Um, if the ACO's spending was $105, um, they would owe money back to CMS to get to $105, and CMS would have to pay out that additional, uh, or if it were $110, sorry, they would pay that additional $5. So there's a risk corridor. If the ACO performs really, really well, AC, the, the Medicare payer would, would keep that additional benefit. If they perform really, really poorly, there's some additional protection where Medicare would step back in. 
And so, uh, and I'm looking at slide eight now for those of you who were unable to look at it online. Um, you can see the ACO's performance um, in uh, 2018 and 2019. It looks like the labels are cut out. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, the target in 2018 was 339 million. The ACO's performance was 322 million. So they had uh, savings in that year. In performance year 19, their target was 496 million and the ACO's performance was 484 million. So they again achieved um, shared savings in performance year 19. So as a reminder, I came before you um, a couple months ago to talk about the 2020 benchmark. Um, and at that time, the board unanimously voted to amend its proposal for performance year 2020. Uh, midstream due to the um, repercussions of the public health emergency posed by COVID-19. And as a result of that, uh, to take a page out of one, uh, I'm sorry, the, the larger shared savings, um, oh gosh, next generation ACO program, they're using a retrospective trend. So they're gonna see what actually happens to expenditures between 19 and 20 to kind of make the target um, reflect what's happening statewide. Um, the, the major win I think for the ACO here is that it did allow from, for some additional financial flexibilities for Medicare. So during the public health emergency, there is no downside risk to ACOs. And it also removes any um, costs associated with COVID ep episodes from their total cost of care. So they are not on the hook for those expenditures. And uh, so, what we do to figure out that trend is we look at all the Vermont residents who would theoretically be eligible to, uh, to attribute to the ACO. And we look at what their expenditures were in 2019. And we take a look at that same population um, of people who could attribute to the ACO in 2020 um, or eligible for, for attribution to the ACO in 2020 and see what their expenditures look like. And again, um, through, incurred through August and paid through November, knowing that we're missing the UVM claims, that trend right now is negative 13%. So that's a substantial decline between the performance years. Um, I'm sure that's not news to anyone here that, um, that our providers are feeling that. So um, the only way I could think of to try to Distill 2021 is a quote from Winston Churchill, which is, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside of an enigma. So we have a lot of extreme uncertainty um, heading into 2021. The pace of the recovery, the potential effects of care that's been deferred during the pandemic, and any costs associated with vaccination are very difficult to predict at this time. We are sure that expenditures in 2020 will be well below a typical year, which means that the growth between 2017 and 2020 are almost assured to satisfy the goals of the all pair model agreement. So it's possible that the access to quality care and providers may have be more concerned when thinking about 2021. Um, and I also think that this is a good time to try to take advantage of the very tangible benefits of the predictable and stable payments, such as the Medicaid program pr provide in thinking about expanding um, some of the delivery reform that is currently underway. So when thinking about um, the 2021 benchmarks, um, the proposal would be to replicate the, the amended 2020 methodology for 2021. So that would mean using the actual claims experience for the full statewide set of beneficiaries who would have, would, um, would have attributed in 2020 or were eligible for attribution in 2020, compare that to the same set of folks who would be eligible for attribution in 2021 and use that as the trend rate in the benchmark. Um, we would actually, for the base experience, we would wait until we had three months of run out and see um, for the individuals who would have attributed to one care in 2020 based on the 2021 benchmark, what their costs were in 2020 and see what that trend looks like. Um, we also um, know that this would have the advantage of extending the PHE protections to the ACO, which means continuing to remove the COVID episodes from their total cost of care, as well as eliminating any downside risk during the public health emergency. So um, the benchmark essentially has three components. 
Um, so starting from the left, the historical experience, again, that's where we would take what the Medicare medical claim spending was in 2020 for beneficiaries who would have attributed to one care in 2020 if the 2021 network had been in place take the number of people who will attribute to the ACO for 2021, so the prospective number of people who we know will attribute based on their primary care relationships, and then using the trend, which would be the actual change from 20 to 21 for all Vermont Medicare beneficiaries eligible for ACO alignment, and that would set the financial target for 2021. So the trade-off here obviously would be that the, the actual benchmark wouldn't be known until after the fact, um, but given all the uncertainty, that might not be as, as bad a deal as it might be in other times. <clears throat> and I'd like to conclude today by just um, giving you some background on the advanced shared savings component of the benchmark. So the advanced shared savings are uh, a mechanism uh, to help extend some investments to some Vermont programs. Um, the primary care medical home payments, the community health scheme payments, and the support as services at home payments were once funded through a federal demonstration called the Multi-Payer Advanced Primary Care Demonstration, Practice Demonstration. And that ended in 2016, and along with it, the federal funding that came. So the agreement included some provisions to allow the state to continue funding those programs, particularly because they demonstrated savings to the federal government. But it's important to know that these funds are um, added to the benchmark and they do not represent performance risk. The advance does factor into the reconciliation at settlement, but it's not additional performance risk. And what I mean by that is the benchmark that I was talking about earlier is the financial target. That is where the ACO's performance is really judged. And then there's this addition of the advanced shared savings reconciled at settlement that, um, that, that has historically been used to fund, continue the funding of these programs with some federal dollars. So just to give you an example, um, here's a shared savings example for a Medicare settlement. So in both cases, whether or not you have the advanced shared savings, that performance benchmark, that first set of the, the, the benchmark equation would be $400 million in this fake made up example. And then if you were to include the advanced savings, you could add on say 8 million, which would mean that the total benchmark is increased in the, in the advanced savings model at the 408 million versus 400 million without the savings. And so either way, the ACO's total cost of care would come in at 395 million. Um, I just made up a quality withhold of $200,000. And here's where it gets different. So the gross savings that the ACO would see with the advance is 12.8 million. Without that, the gross savings are 4.8 million. At that point, they take into account what was already paid in the advance. So when you deduct 8 million from the 12.8, you end up in exactly the same place. So in both cases, the ACO has saved $4.8 million. So again, that performance risk is not changed. In an example where there's a shared loss, so again, we have the same financial benchmark target of 400 million. Um, we add in the 8 million, but if the ACO's total cost of care were 405 million and we still deducted the $200,000 for a quality withhold, you can see with the savings they actually have, uh, I'm sorry, when they include the advanced savings, there actually is gross savings of $2.8 million, which actually nets a loss of $5.2 million. Again, that's mathematically the same as um, if there had not been advanced savings. So in both cases, the performance risk, they, the ACO would be on the hook for $5.2 million back to, to, to the federal government. The difference would be, you know, they had in the advanced savings example, they theoretically would have also paid out $8 million to providers um, to, to support those programs. So their liability would be, you know, $8 million plus $5.2 million. <clears throat> So I just want to be clear for board members that, you know, that this is just a, a mechanism by which the federal dollars are able to be leveraged for this purpose. Um, but really that this is a decision for the ACO budget. 
Um, in the past, the Green Mountain Care Board has set a minimum amount for the ACO to invest in these programs in their budget order. And I would say that for 2021, the ACO um, budgeted 8.4 million for those programs. And it was the same amount that they budgeted in performance year 2020. Um, so, you know, I think that the ACO appreciates having this to help um, fund this and not come up with that, that money ahead of time um, if they are ordered to make that investment, but um, the decision really rests with the budget order. And that was all I had today. I'm happy to take any questions. Super, thank you very much, Sarah. Are there questions from the board? This is Robin, I had one question. Go um, ahead, Robin. Sarah, so when you were talking about the uh, 2021 benchmark and some of the advantages given that we're still in the middle of the public health emergency, you noted that there'd be no downside risk during the public health emergency. What happens if the public health emergency ends prior to the end of 2021? We'd come back and revisit it, or do, do you have any ideas of how that might work just thinking ahead? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the main variable there is, um, you know, if the public health emergency were lifted in March, um, I am sure that our federal partners and us would come together to amend this proposal to go back to a prospective target for the remainder of the performance year. Um, in the case where, you know, it kind of um, bleeds into, you know, more than half the year, I think our recommendation would be to, um, you know, remove some of those protections, but keep the methodology the same. Uh, I think the methodology does make downside risk um, pretty unlikely, um, just given that it's, it's scaling to actuals, but that um, explicit protection would be removed, I would assume. Thanks. And then um, I'm assuming because this is a contract with Medicare that Medicare would be using the federal public health emergency declaration, not the states, or do you know uh, which correct. definition? It, yeah. Okay. yeah, we're following the federal definition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Are there other questions or comments from the board? I have one, um, <clears throat> just the, the whole advanced uh, sharing savings is before my time. I got, Robin understands it, but um, to me, the way I interpret that is that it's just a mechanism to finance uh, the, the distribution of those funds to, um, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, to, um, um, I'm blanking on the, uh, on the name of the uh, organization out there, the uh, Blueprint, for example. Uh, and, um, so is that all it is, is basically a way to, you know, kind of fund it, a lot, a kind of a no interest loan for a year and uh, it settles up at the end of the process? And if so, w why did that happen in the first place? Sure. Um, so as I understand it, there were only two possible ways uh, for this money to come to the feds for this purpose. Um, one was used in 2017, um, and I never remember the proper name, but it essentially was a grant um, that was bestowed on DIVA and distributed through DIVA for this purpose. Um, and the second way is through these advanced shared savings, which were kind of a creative mechanism um, to allow this. And the reason for it is that um, the process but that was used in 17 uh, required a clearance. Um, through the, the powers that be up at Medicare and frankly takes a long time and makes the funds more vulnerable, uh, whereas this decision really keeps it in Vermont's control. Thank you. Makes sense. Okay. Are there other questions or comments from the board? Is there public comment? Public comment or questions? Well, a very silent morning. <laughs> Sarah, what are the next steps? 
Sure. I, I will. I'll be, I'll see you again this afternoon, but um, I'll also see you again next week for a potential vote on this recommendation. And do we have a, a public comment time period? Oh, certainly that would start now uh, through uh, next Tuesday. Okay. One last chance for anyone to offer any public comment or questions. If not, thank you very much, Sarah. Good work as always. Thank you. <laughs> Talk to you later. And next we're gonna turn to um, uh, Green Mountain Care Board uh, payment reform alum and a former um, leader of a Vermont hospital, um, our old friend, Richard Slusky. And Richard, maybe you could introduce your colleague who's going to join you in the presentation. Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Kevin? I can, I can't see you, but I can hear you loud and clear. I'm having trouble turning my camera on. I had it on originally and then turned it off and now it won't go back on. So Is that just because you didn't want to wear a tie, Richard? I actually almost did, Kevin, but you know, I didn't <laughs> go that far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, let me try to share, can I try to open the slides for you? Um, make sure I can do this. Can you see that? Not yet. Now? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, so In Go ahead. I'm wondering if you want to send them to Abigail and maybe she can. She has them actually. Okay. So maybe that's the best thing to do. Abigail, are you available to assist? I got it, Susan. Oh, I've got Michelle. And um, Chair Mullen, I was wondering. Um, I know we're gonna we're going to hear from um, Richard and his colleagues, but um, Michelle Degree was also going to have a few words before he started because Michelle Degree and Lindsay Kill worked on this project with um, the NESCO team. Is that okay? I was assuming that was going to happen, but it was not on the uh, printed agenda. So uh, I, I tend to uh, follow the script so I don't get into trouble. <laughs> but Michelle, take it away. <laughs> All right. Uh, just to confirm, can you see? my screen we can it's a All nice right. uh, blue color it's very blue yes it's really casting a delightful shadow on my face um so i just wanted to give a couple of quick remarks as susan mentioned uh lindsay and i were able to work with on point and nesco throughout this process that's been oh gosh richard probably over a year at this point um since our last meeting um in 20 19, and then we had a virtual meeting, obviously, in 2020 um, of the group, and um, we were able to work uh, and produce some data that's used in this first of its kind uh, comparison of primary care investment across six New England states. Um, I will say um, I just wanted to point out a couple of key points for the board and for others that this report in and of itself will not match with what we produced for our total cost of care reporting, nor with what we reported for our Act 17 primary care spend report as requested by the legislature. Um, and part of the, the main reason for that truly is that when you're looking at six states, finding a common denominator means that you're going to lose some of the data that we are lucky enough to have access to here in Vermont. So. Um, I just really wanted to preface that and while you're when you see some of the great data that's going to be presented by Richard and I believe Carl and Carolyn are on from on point um, but I'll let them introduce themselves uh, I want to just make sure that it's clear that you know we are aware that this doesn't match and I think we'll try our best to kind of make those comparisons um, moving forward when um, when folks might reference this report or even try to put together maybe a one pager of kind of how these things differ um, between our, our typical annual total cost of care reporting and this report here, um, focusing specifically on the six states and um, not to get ahead of myself, but I, I think, or to get ahead of Richard, but I think um, once 
we kind of get through the slides, you'll hear a couple of recommendations that the work group might have for additional analyses or moving forward. And um, Lindsay was really um, pivotal in helping to frame some of those. So I think if there are questions on the board, I believe Lindsay and I are both on the line um, and can, can stick around to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I'm hoping this kind of sets up a nice conversation for your um, panel discussion this afternoon. So with that, I will turn it over to Richard and the OnPoint team. Um, Richard, if you just wanna let me know when to advance, I can do that from my end. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And you can advance uh, the slide. So as, as Michelle mentioned, this, was, uh, this study was made possible through the collaboration of the six New England states including Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. And um, uh, it was sponsored through uh, the New England States Consortium of Systems Organization, NESCO, and um, a contract with OnPoint Health Data. And we have, I believe, uh, with us from OnPoint, um, uh, Carolyn Conrad and Carl Finnison, who were very instrumental in helping us develop this report along with Katie McGraves Lloyd and uh, Jeff Spaulding from OnPoint. Uh, next slide. So I, I just, um, I also want to recognize Michelle and Lindsay for the work that they did on the um, uh, project and also uh, 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 Sarah uh, Lindbergh, who I believe behind the scenes did a tremendous amount of data work. So I want to thank Thank you all for, for your effort uh, in this regard. Next slide. So the, the, as, as Michelle mentioned, this project has been kind of in development for over well over a year. I think it's probably closer to two years. Um, but we were very um, encouraged to see the Primary Care Collaborative, which is a national organization, actually include in its consensus recommendations that um, the importance of tracking uh, primary care investments through a standardized measure. And this, the purpose of our report was to try to get the states, the six states to agree on standard definitions of who primary care providers are and what services are most commonly provided by them uh, that we could universally agree upon. And uh, that, that approach uh, we felt um, was reinforced through the consensus, one of the consensus recommendations from the Primary Care Collaborative in uh, uh, 2018. Um, and that that's, that's approaching this from a standardized approach uh, was really necessary in order to track uh, the level of investment and also that uh, these increases in investment might lead to improved quality. Next slide. Uh, the purpose of this report specifically is to use that standardized data to identify the percentage of all payer primary care spending relative to the overall healthcare spending in each state. And that, that's really the primary um, purpose of the report. Uh, what we did not do and what is not included in this report is a statement about how much investment is the right amount or how, what are the measures to evaluate the impact of those investments uh, on uh, uh, cost, quality, and access in the healthcare environment. So uh, if you're looking for the, the golden nugget that says this is the right amount, uh, you won't find it in this report. That does go beyond the scope of what we intended to report. Next slide. Um, so just to give you some background, there's no national standard on the measurement of primary care expenditures. And we looked at several studies that have come prior to this study and all, none of the studies use the same definitions uh, in total. They're close, but not uh, uh, what we've used uh, in our study. Uh, as I mentioned, it's six New England states. It included about $7.2 million, uh, 2 million uh, members in commercial, Medicare Advantage, Medicare fee-for-service, and uh, Medicaid members. 
It's the first, to our knowledge, the first multi-state report using standard definitions of providers and services. Um, we did not include OBGYN providers in the definition of primary care providers, but we did report on OBGYN providers and services separately in the report. Um, we did not use some providers that uh, are sometimes considered as primary care, such as naturopaths, homeopaths, uh, behavioral health providers uh, were not included in the study. And the information regarding non-claims payments or value-based payments was uh, collected directly from payers. That's not information that's included in the APCDs in the state. states. Excuse me. Next slide. So just to give you, uh, the, 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 there were four definitions. Uh, one was the primary or core definition, which were the definitions of primary care uh, providers, including general practice, family medicine, pediatrics, fertile medicine, nurse practitioner, and physician's assistants, and subspe some subspecialties in each of those categories. So geriatricians, for example, uh, hospice and palliative care providers uh, were also included. It did not include OBGYN providers or services, and the services were limited to a selected number of services uh, that were limited to those most commonly provided by primary care providers. Definition two are the same providers um, excluding the OBGYN services but the definition of services is broader in that it includes all services provided by those providers. So it's a broader definition of the services, but the same definition of providers. Definition three were the uh, OBGYN uh, services payments for the OBGYN practitioners. And that, that excluded, in this case, uh, services provided by P uh, primary care providers. Um, that definition, if, if states want to include OBGYN, they can add that to either definition one or two or both uh, to get a, a sense from their perspective. If they want to include the impact of OBGYNs, they can do that from this study. And then definition four were OBGYN services provided by um, primary care providers. Next slide. For the, um, the non-claims expenditures or the value-based payments, um, we did uh, develop on point, developed a template to collect the non-claims payments. I'll show you that um, later on. But it includes uh, services such as capitation payments, risk-based reconciliations, uh, PCMH payments, provider incentives, uh, HIT payments for uh, health information technology improvements, and then workforce investments. Next slide. So the strengths of this study, in our opinion, were that all of the states had existing APCD data to generate most of the required data. So that was very important that the states could actually produce the data. We also used what we call a, a, a distributed model which means that rather than hiring one consultant to go into each state, uh, into each state's database and pull uh, the data from the state's database, uh, we instead developed specifications based on the definitions of providers and services that we had generated. And uh, OnPoint developed specific uh, specifications which were given to the states and their analysts in each state were able to uh, pull the data and the uh, summarized reports formats uh, that, um, that we were requesting. So this, this actually was a less expensive approach for one, and it also allowed the states to become more familiar with the data specifications and the, specifically the data um, as they reported it uh, back to OnePoint. Uh, the specifications and the data the definitions were those that were agreed upon by the six states. And then 
uh, kind of supplemented through discussions with Encoy and NESCO. But ultimately it was NESCO that determined the final specifications. Um, and then there was a robust quality control process um, once the data was reported. So we're pretty confident that the data is reliable and, uh, and uh, in good shape from the states. Next slide. Some of the weaknesses uh, were that uh, not all the states had complete data for Medicaid and Medicare. Um, we did not uh, uh, evaluate the reimbursement rates or benefits uh, by payer uh, as part of this study. Um, so, and there is variation as you will see uh, by, in, by pay, comparing payer to payer and also state to state. So taking an average of any of this data, you know, for a specific purpose uh, might not be a good idea. You may want to look specifically at your state's data and then the, the payers within the state specifically. Um, the non-claims data, as I mentioned, was not reported through the AC, APCDs and needed to be collected directly from payers, which proved to be somewhat of a challenge. Uh, pharmacy expenditures were not sufficiently reliable to be included in the report, and the impact of the pharmacy rebates uh, was not determined. And we had a discussion yesterday, actually, in a meeting where uh, it was reported that those rebates are very significant. So to report um, the expenditures of pharmacy from the APCDs without taking into account the rebates may, may lead to an overstatement of the pharmacy expenditures. Um, and not, o not all of the states were able to link uh, membership. I don't know if you all can see that. I'm having it blocked by the my tray here, but uh, um, we, weren't, we weren't able to link uh, member eligibility to medical claims or pharmacy benefits. We did aggregate um, by payer the number of members and member months, but we couldn't do a specific link on individual members. Next slide. You're all hearing me, I assume. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so let's get into some of the results. Next slide. And this is on the claims payments. So you can see um, uh, in, in this uh, figure one, uh, this is uh, by payer for uh, uh, the definition one and two. It's definition one, again, being uh, primary care providers with selected services. Definition two, primary care providers, all services. And you can see um, that there is significant variation by payer as a percent of total healthcare expenditures um, with Medicare and Medi Medicare fee for service and Medicare Advantage being on the lower side as a percent, commercial and Medicaid being on the higher side. Um, on average in the blue box over on the left, 5.5% uh, of total payments went to primary care using definition one and 8.2% using definition two. Next slide. So the next slide is the uh, per member per month payments, which is which actually kind of caught our attention. Because if you notice here, Medicare fee for service and Medicare Advantage are actually higher on a PMPM -PM basis than Medicaid or commercial. And that's true for both definition one and two, which we think, we believe indicates that older individuals require more primary care services, um, even though the percent of those payments as a percent of total healthcare costs are, are lower, the actual services um, received by older individuals, primary care services are actually higher uh, or are more costly. So on a PMPM -PM basis, you can see that Medicare fee for service and Medicare are higher than either commercial or Medicaid, which was an interesting observation we thought. Um, next slide. 
So this is by state, and uh, you can see that there's variation. Um, and again, definition one, and this is commercial payers. So you can see that there's variation not only uh, by, by um, well, you'll see there's variation by pair, but also by state. So again, and again, I don't know if you can see the state numbers on the bottom, mine is cut off. So I'm sorry for that. Um, can you see those, Kevin? Or yes. No, you can, okay. Good. Yeah, you might have your screen enlarged a little bit if you just... Uh... Yeah, I, I'm trying not to touch any button that I don't okay. I'm not real with. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, you can. See, I'm glad you can see that. But you can see that the, there's variation by state. And then um, uh, you'll in the next slide, you'll see by payer as well. So this is Medicare Advantage. And again, you know, and, and also within the states, there's uh, uh, differences in terms of the payments, uh, the percent payments from uh, by payer uh, as well. Next slide. And this is true for now we're on Medicare fee for service. So again, you know, a lower uh, or a, well, not so much a broader range, but it starts lower for Medicare fee for service as a percent. And this is a function when you're looking at Medicare as a percent of total healthcare expenditures for Medicare, as you get older, you're using more hospitalizations, more specialty services, et cetera. So you would expect that the percent of primary care uh, payments are lower. And then next is Medicaid, I believe. Next slide. So Medicaid again, um, you know, difference in in uh, by state, and there's a difference in the payer as well. For the average here is about eight percent, and then uh, ten point four percent for definition two. Next slide. So this kind of summarizes this. Uh, if you look at the all state average uh, for commercial Medicaid, Medicare, and Medicare fee for service. As a percent, you can see that the different payers have different percentages. And then again, if you look at the PMPM, um, and this is definition one, you can see that the uh, Medicare Advantage and fee for service has a lower percentage, but a higher PMPM. So I just wanted to highlight those for you. And that's true for definition two as well. Next slide. So you can see again, you can see that while all the numbers are higher, uh, the Medicare PMPMs are higher than the commercial and Medicaid. And I'll get into a discussion of why that's important in a second. Next slide. So we also looked at um, these payments uh, by age, and these are all pair percentage payments by age group. Uh, for definition one, and you can see that the uh, payments uh, as a percent of total are much higher for younger, for children in particular, and then younger adults, and then they decrease as one ages. And this again is a percent of payments relative to total healthcare, total medical payments. So children, you know, generally have more primary care visits than they would other hospitalizations, things like that. As you get older, you're using more specialty care and hospitalizations, which reduces the amount of the primary care percentage. Next slide. When you look at a PMPM, we see the same kind of relationship. So initially, uh, the younger adult, the younger children, um, you know, just born or or one to four um, have a you know the uh, just born obviously that's the major component is the primary care, and then it it dropped. Whoops! Oh. Did I? So I think yeah. So I want to be on the next one. Next slide. Yes. So you can see that it it drops down and then the PMPM increases as the population ages. Next slide. 
So this this is where I think you know as we're thinking more about uh, capitation and uh, value based payments, uh, other forms of value based payments, I would you can see that the commercial payments go down as a population age as, as a percent of total in all cases, and the com, the uh, pro, the PMPM, which would form the basis of a capitation, kind of has significant variation as you get older, uh, and then it kind of dips and then goes up again. So I, one of the things I think this points out to me at least, and I think is uh, consistent with some of the discussions we had when I was at the Green Mountain Care Board, is you really have to take into consideration the mix of a practice when you're thinking about the capitation. So if you have providers who are primarily seeing an older population, their PMPM may be in the 30s uh, or 40s. And um, you know, if you've got a younger population, it may be less. So it, it's just something to think about as we're thinking about moving toward more capitated payments. Next slide. Um, this this uh, is a uh, the payments as a percent by service type. And again, just to highlight, if you look just at office visits and preventive care, you're at about 90% uh, of all primary care services uh, as a percent. Um, and then immunizations, you're probably 95, 96%. The ones in orange, I thought were interesting because, and I'm not sure I'm right on this, but um, there's a lot of services, transitional care management, chronic care management, advanced care planning, that I don't believe are accounted for through claims. So for Medicaid, for example, I know a lot of money is spent on these types of services that, that do benefit uh, primary care practices, but are not really considered part of the payment to primary care services, at least through claims. Um, so I just thought I would note that, that this might be an area to really take a little harder look at. I think even commercial payers often pay for these types of services through um, what they can see. I'm not sure if they put them in administrative categories, but they, they don't always uh, include them in the claims. So we may be missing um, a good deal of investment in primary care that just isn't reported in a traditional way. So that's 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 my theory, but you know we can discuss that. Um, next slide. So on the non-claims payments, next slide. Uh, we we did have to develop a template uh, that uh, kind of identified the types of services we were looking at, and I discussed this a little earlier. So you've got the capitation, the risk-based reconciliation. PCMA, PCMH patients, and we tried to identify, to define them based on other studies that had been done so that there would be more of a standard definition on these payments as well. Next slide. And then the others are pro provider incentives, uh, performance-based payments, investments in health information technology, and workforce payments. Next slide. So this is actually the template. This just shows one category for capitation, but this is what we would propose you might want to think about in um, when you're looking for information from the payers, that you'd want to know how much are they actually paying in non-claims payments, which is the third column, um, and how those are broken up into members and member months and then of that total, how much of those payments are actually going or intended to go to primary care practices? And again, based on members and member months, if possible. Um, a lot of non-claims-based payments are not made directly to primary care practices. They're often made to health systems or hospitals that employ uh, primary care providers. So it's hard to determine exactly where these payments are going. And I think uh, we think that a more specific reporting requirements would be helpful in resolving that. 
Next slide. Um, in terms of the collection of the data, we only really could collect information on the commercial payers and only four of the six states were able to collect uh, payment information regarding non-claims payments. So as I said earlier, this study kind of highlighted the need to work with states and payers to track these uh, types of payments in a more consistent way. I would mention, I think this is correct, that Vermont Medicaid uh, is now paying about 80 plus percent of its total payments uh, through uh, non-claims based payments, through prospective payments uh, to the ACO. So this percentage in the blue uh, of the claims payments for Medicaid would be much higher, well, lower, I'm sorry. And the green would be much higher, uh, which are the non-claims based payments. So if we're moving in that direction, I think you're gonna start to see overall uh, that the blue bar is starting to uh, become lower, the percentage payments, and the green higher, uh, a higher percentage, which indicates that we need to have better uh, means of collecting accurate information for both claims and non-claims payments. Next slide. So in terms of the non-claims payments, uh, just to summarize, um, reliability, the um, payers weren't able to report the non-claims payment using these defined categories. Uh, it was not clear what percent of the payments were used to support primary care practices. The state analysts did provide estimates for us um, on what they thought was going to primary care, but I think it really, we need better data. Uh, and as I said, they weren't necessarily directed to primary care providers or practices and may have been paid instead to hospitals or other healthcare systems. And it's not known how much of that actually got to support primary care. Um, and then the estimates of the total commercial payments uh, that benefited varied uh, from state to state. Next slide. Uh, again, just here at the bottom, you can see uh, highlighted in yellow. Um, so you've got the total amounts of these payments, but I think what's important to note is the primary care payments from claims uh, by state, you know, ranged from 8%, 10.997. But if you look at the impact of the non-claim, uh, which includes when you look, when you total the two together, the claims and the non-claims payments, there's significant variation in the impact those payments have from a state to state basis. The expectation is that the primary care claim payments will decline over time as we move to more value-based payments and these value-based payments will have more of an impact. So again, the importance of collecting good information on value-based payments or non-claims payments will be very important. Next slide. So the summary of this, uh, they're usually not reported to the states through the APCDs. Uh, it's anticipated to increase over time. Intent, the, these payments of non-claims payments are intended to incentivize primary care practices to restructure their operations to support improved quality, reduce unnecessary utilization, and increase focus on population health. We're recommending that states <clears throat> may need to consider adoption of new regulation statutes or rules to standardize the way in which this data is collected, uh, the non-claims payment information. Next slide. So issues, recommendations, and conclusions. Some of the issues uh, that we had to make decisions are whether one was whether or not to include out-of-state providers, which we did include. So these are <clears throat> these um, payment amounts are uh, based on allowed amounts uh, that have been identified associated with residents of the states, regardless of where their providers were located. 
Uh, in the APCDs, there was no field or code specific to identify the site of uh, where the care was delivered. So that's something that might be improved in the APCD. The defining primary care providers and services is critical. Uh, linking to eligibility, we think is would be uh, a, a significant improvement in the data um, to make sure that we're linking members both to medical claims and to uh, uh, pharmacy claims as well. Uh, the retail, retail pharmacy, whether to include or not, we did not include retail pharmacy. Um, and as it turns out, I think that was a good decision given uh, what we learned later about the impact of rebates. Um, plan paid or allow, allowed amounts. Uh, most, most of the studies that we looked at did use allowed amounts, and that's what we agreed to do. Uh, some use plan paid. Uh, none use charges, by the way. So I wouldn't, we don't want to go down the road of using charges for this, uh, this type of an evaluation. Um, we did not include dental and vision services. There was some discussion about that. Um, and uh, there, the, the Medicaid non-medical service or non-medical services is something that I think we need to also look at further as I mentioned earlier, because I think there are, there may be, there, there appears to be a lot of investment in care management, care coordination, et cetera, and other types of uh, services that, um, that are not included in this kind of a study. Next slide. So policy issues for states. Um, Ensure that all payers report claims payments uh, to the APCD in a standardized format, including Medicaid and Medicare uh, to the extent possible. Um, consider rules, regulations, statutes, et cetera, regarding the reporting of flow on payers uh, regarding the reporting of non-claims payment. Uh, standardize a more uh, consistent approach to reporting on Medicaid services and payments and um, look at approaches that incorporate the percentage of both total cost of care and per member per month. Uh, so this is that issue about percentage uh, and the relationship between the percentage of payments, primary care payments and the PMPM. Next slide. Some technical issues. Um, uh, you know, as investment in primary care increases, uh, payers are going to want to know what the value of those uh, increased payments might be. So I think um, uh, understanding or developing some measures to evaluate this association between the primary care payments and the level of those payments and performance outcomes is going to be critical. Um, we were with COVID, uh, there's, there's more remote care management now, there's more remote care delivery. Um, so I think uh, we're gonna need to understand the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on, on these payments um, uh, and total healthcare expenditures. And then the pharmacy payments, I think if we're gonna incorporate that into these types of studies, we need to understand the impacts of the rebates and better link eligibility to pharmacy claims. Um, and then uh, the evaluation of the these broader services that we used in definition two, it would be interesting to know which of those services that were not included in definition one had the greatest impact on increasing that percentage of primary care payments uh, to the total medical payments. Next slide. So just to conclude, um, the study benefited from the existence of APD, APCDs in all the states and also from prior reports on the topic. And by the way, I should mention that those averages of 5.5% and 8.2% of primary care relative to total medical costs was very consistent with um, 
the other state reports. So it was certainly in the ballpark for what we saw in other prior reports. Um, using a distributed model, we thought actually worked pretty well. And the states were extremely cooperative. And uh, just want to again thank Michelle and Lindsay and Sarah for the work that they did on this. Um, the results are that investment in primary care was relatively low, the 5.2 and 8.2% compared to total health care expenditures. And we noticed the variation by payer, geography, age group, and other factors. Um, and again, we're not suggesting that we know what the right number is here, but we believe this is certainly when you're comparing to other countries, uh, this investment in the United States in primary care is relatively low. Um, we've highlighted some opportunities to improve study methods, to establish more consistently comparable results. And um, I think the experience uh, enabled us uh, to continue our work together uh, to improve our study methods and uh, uh, ways of looking at this data. So that's all I have. Um, next slide. But I would like to ask Carl or Carolyn, if she's still on, if you have any comments that you'd like to add to this. Well, uh, this is Carl Finnison from On Point Health Data, uh, Director of Analytic Development. Uh, we were thankful for the opportunity to work on this project with the six states. Uh, Back quite a while ago, we did a tri-state study uh, for Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont uh, data that was commissioned by the Dion Khan from Bishka before GMCB. <laughs> uh, and so we were always looking for an opportunity to expand that to the rest of the New England states. So we're thankful for the opportunity to, to do that. Um, also just want to recognize the 30 or so people that participated in this project and for the efforts they made. Uh, we had a pretty rigorous review of the specifications. Uh, states came up with additions and changes, so we modified specifications uh, to enhance uh, the reporting. So it was really a collaborative effort and appreciate that um, uh, that effort. And again, to Lindsay and Michelle and, and all the other states for the quick turnaround, uh, we didn't, uh, the specifications weren't created until June or July and then uh, it was fairly quick turnaround for the states uh, to produce the reports uh, within a couple of months, and then we get get those into a written report. And um, so it was quite a a, a fast project, and uh, but a, a thorough and uh, and enhanced specifications on the project as well from what we started with. That's what I had, Richard. Okay, thanks, Carl. Thank you, and thank you again for all the work that One Point did on this. It was. Yeah. We couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> um, so, um, Kevin, any questions or comments on? The I'm sure there's a lot of them, Richard. I'll start with a few. Um, you know, when you're um, benchmarking Vermont against the other states, am I wrong in in my quick read on this that? Um, we're doing okay in government reimbursement for primary care compared to our colleagues, but maybe a little bit behind in commercial. And also maybe you could comment on, um, you know, everybody talks about Rhode Island being way out in front with the legislation that required a percentage spend on primary care. And yet it looked like at least as far as government that they weren't doing much better than Vermont on that. So I'm just curious what your what your take on that is and, and if it's fair to try to benchmark based on this study. Yeah, I think, I think, um, and, I, and I'll, I'll get, see if Carl has anything to add on this, but I, I would say using the word okay even is, you know, kind of uh, implies something. And we, we don't know what the right number is. So I, I would agree that it does appear that Vermont is doing well, you know, better on the um, uh, uh, government side uh, on the on the investment in primary care, and could probably improve on on the uh, commercial side. Um, Rhode Island uh, specifically focused on their commercial, cell, uh, fully insured population, 
So it's, um, you know, I, I think, and, and I don't certainly don't want to speak for Rhode Island, but I, I think their effort was really more on the uh, commercial side to make sure to try to encourage the commercial payers to increase their investment in primary care. And they actually, at the same time, uh, put caps on the amounts that hospitals could raise their rates. So they, you know, they kind of were trying to shift that emphasis from the hospital system uh, to primary care. So, um, and, and as, as Michelle said earlier, I think, and Carl might want to add to this, um, these numbers that in our report don't square specifically with the report you guys did earlier. And there are some reasons for that that I think either Michelle or Carl might want to address. So Carl, did you want to speak to that or Michelle? Sure, I can um, speak to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, just going back to the Rhode Island. Um, so one of the things about the Rhode Island uh, studies or reported data is that uh, they don't actually provide any methods or specifications for how the data is created. It's up to the insurers to provide that data in. Uh, and I know they they potentially include non-claims payments in that data as well. So um, just a little caveat about <laughs> the Rhode Island information that comes out. I know a lot of people point to Rhode Island because of the trend and the 1% increase in primary care each year. Um, Concerning the Vermont uh, specific results, um, so commercial was on the lower end and of the states, but Medicaid and Medicare was on the higher end. In fact, as, as Richard showed, um, Vermont was highest among the six states for Medicaid and second highest for Medicare and then lowest for uh, commercial. So this was a descriptive, our, our work on this study was descriptive. We weren't, uh, there was no intent to evaluate the causes of those variations. So that, that type of thing could continue to be uh, explored. Uh, you know, we didn't adjust for age gender differences, for example, within the commercial population. Uh, so there could be a number of different factors that, that lead to these results or these variances uh, that have yet to be explored. Um, but with Vermont having one of the older demographics, wouldn't it be hard to uh, say that that's a factor in the lower commercial spend? Yeah, the, when you talk about the percent, um, it's it's also related to the denominator as well. So if there's a if there's a higher denominator, if your total medical health care expend for a commercial is higher in Vermont, then that could cause your percent to be lower as well. Okay. One of the recommendations talked about um, requiring um, better reporting so that it's more standardized. And of course, Richard, as you know, we always are getting uh, hit by um, your former colleagues about um, whether or not the, the juice is worth the squeeze and they keep talking about the administrative burden. Are you convinced that it's worth that additional burden to them or is it really a burden to them? Well, um... I think it is worth it because I, I mean I don't I, I think what's what we're going to see going forward is more and more emphasis being placed on I, I mean if you adopt the Medicaid approach to to these payments uh, you know you could be in the 80 85 percent of non-claims payments and if you can't really identify where those payments are going and and then ultimately develop measures to evaluate the impact of those payments on reducing costs, improving quality, improving access. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, uh, how how you would justify, you know, that shift. I mean, because because the theory is, if you move to value-based payments or non-claims payments, uh, there should be some impact on the system. So I yes, I think it's worth it. Um, and there will always be belly aching, you know, around any change. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I think it's worth also evaluating the measures that are currently in place and whether they're producing the results you want. So if there's a trade-off to maybe reduce some burden in one area, where and if you think it's it's more valuable in another, 
um, I think that's a reasonable discussion to have. On your discussion of what to include and what not to include in primary care, that's been a hot topic for a number of years without much general agreement. And it almost looks like here, there still isn't general agreement. It, it's just that it was agreed to do the reporting the same way um, for the comparison. But for example, you often hear that, you know, um, for many women, their gynecologist is the only medical person that they're visiting. And yet it's not included, but it's collected here. I was just curious if you ever think there will be a common definition across the country for primary care. So this this was a, a, a big discussion that we had, you know, uh, in, in the group. And the approach we took was that those discussions have continued on and on. I mean, there are people that think OBGYN should be in. I know that you guys require naturopaths, I believe, uh, to be included in primary care. Um, and, and others, homeopaths, behavioral health would like to be included. Um, so what we tried to do was say, let's, let's try to agree on a core uh, definition of providers and services that we can all agree on. I mean, the, you know, and then if other, if state and, and get a base report. So that's definition one, in effect. That, that's the definition of providers and services. Um, definition two broadens that to include more services, but same providers. Then if states want to add OBGYN or they want to add naturopaths, you can see the way we did it was to separate those services out and, um, and, and add them on to the core definitions, add them on to your results. So if you get, and by the way, I mean, when we added OBGYN, when we had, I don't think I showed that, but when we evaluated the impact of those services and those providers on the total percent, it was less than 1%, um, you know, and, and that was for OBGYN. So, so I think, I think in this case, I would say it's not worth having this discussion that you never reach agreement on, but you could agree on a core and then, and then allow the states to add to that core as they see fit. On your slide that um, showed the PMPM -PM by, um, age category the the number the dollar number went down for 85 plus any insight into why that goes down uh i'm trying to find that one um well it didn't it did for 85 plus on the pm pm yeah this isn't the one i'm thinking of michelle it's the one that had the uh um because it's actually I've got around $36 on the- Okay, the, right here, you've got 85 plus at 29.24 um, for commercial, which um, is oh, lower for, than- Yeah, yeah. Than the, uh, and even on the uh, Medicare, it's down, but not, not much from the 75 to 84, it goes down a little bit. Right. Uh, it just, it just seemed like, I was trying to reconcile in my brain why that would be. I, 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 Richard. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. Maybe. I can take a stab at that. Okay. <laughs> it's just speculation, obviously, but you know, once people get really old, then sometimes they're getting their care through a specialist, and sometimes the specialist can almost start to function like a, a primary care doc, like an endocrinologist or a cardiologist, and and so on. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Yep. And lastly, um, Vermont, um, we here at the Green Mountain Care Board just uh, formed a technical advisory group on um, prescription drugs because we continue to see that as being a, a, a large cost driver in rate increases. And it looked like um, you had a large discussion on uh, rebates. And I was wondering if our group should be reaching out to anybody that you talk to to try to get better insight on that. So our discussion was basically, we don't know what the rebates are. <laughs> so it wasn't that we could identify them, at least at, in, in the group we were in. Um, but, 
you know, I think others have, have gone further and looked at those rebates specifically, and they seem to be significant. So, uh, Carl, do you want to add to that one? Carl, are you? Sorry, I don't have an immediate response to that. I, I think there's one state that may be trying to collect rebate information. I can't recall which state it is. But yeah, if I mean, you come across anything, shoot us an email. Okay. I mean, I, I don't remember. I, I forget who it was, but um, I believe, you know, yesterday, I mean, it was, uh, there was some indication. Oh, go ahead. Hi, this is Lindsay. Um, yeah, I thought, was, yeah, I don't want to speak. Eight. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I am in both. Um, so I worked on this project for the primary care spend report for NESCO. And I'm also, uh, I've joined in with Christina and Robin in the pharmacy um uh, advisory group just in like a listening capacity and um, it's true that a couple of months ago the NESCO group identified um, that potentially we were not seeing the full picture on pharmacy spend <clears throat> excuse me from claims and then um, yeah like even just earlier this week um, I sat in on a pharmacy um, group discussion and it was very evident that, um, that for Medicaid anyway in Vermont we're not getting the full picture on cost and so that you know it's it was a good thing that we didn't include pharmacy in this analysis right now um, and I uh, pharmacy data is of, of enormous interest to me so I'm I'm kind of excited to be both involved in the NESCO effort and also getting to listen in on on what this group is is educating us about. So, so not to take us uh, uh, far off the field, Lindsay, but um, I have had conversations in the past that uh, dealt with um, trying to um, get the actual cost after the rebates, and I believe there's a southern state that requires. Um, a, a reporting that's fairly simple because apparently McKesson is the main um, um, collector of all this data. So just something that you may want to consider in your discussions at the uh, um, technical advisory group that there may be a way to get there. Um, but again, my knowledge is pretty limited, so I'm not going to step in the quicksand here. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to other board members for questions. For Richard or Carl, Carl. Kevin, this is Michelle. Could I just make one point before we move on to other board members? Just a point of clarification. Sure. sure. So I just wanted to um, make sure, and I neglected to mention this at the beginning, but I think there's likely going to be a lot of focus on the commercial rate here, and I wanted to point out that for the purposes of the model and the purposes of the Act 17 report, Medicare Advantage is considered commercial in the state of Vermont. So when they're separated out in this report, um, that's not typically how we would show it. And so that is part of the reason for the fairly large discrepancy between those two reports that you'll see. I just wanted to kind of clarify that because I think it um, caused some confusion, at least at my initial read of the report. So I just wanted to clarify that. But on this report, when we see commercial, it's a standard definition across the six states, correct? Correct. So this is all standard. My point was to say that for our reporting, Medicare Advantage is considered commercial in the state of Vermont for the purposes of the all payer model. So those two would be combined. Yeah, I'm. You know, in some respects, I almost. And again, I shouldn't say anything off the cuff, but when you take a look at um, not including Medicare Advantage, you're looking at um, the age demographics where hopefully some of the things would be addressed in primary care so they wouldn't get to full-blown chronic illnesses. So um, I'm appreciative of this look um, without the uh, Medicare Advantage, but that's just me. So with that, other board members? Yeah, I have a couple questions um, and, and just wanted to add on to some things that Kevin had talked about. Um, 
one thing that came to mind when I was looking at the commercial and, and even all of these is when you look at the age brackets, um, you did that across, I believe, all the states combined. And, you know, do you have the age brackets by state individually? Because maybe there's some information there where it looked for commercial, like the zero, you know, the, the really small uh, children were much higher. Um, and then, you know, it tapered off to the to different in the middle and then it was it got a little bit higher as you got older but you know that mix if we don't have the really young could skew some of that percentage so i i wondered whether we had the age brackets by state um individually as well if you have that information um just looking at i so i'm looking in the appendix uh we have it by payer broken out uh, not by state. Is that correct, Carl? I believe that's right. In the report, we don't have um, not in broken out by. Uh, I by just state. wonder if that may be something you know that's driving the change. And similarly, on the opposite end of the spectrum, on Medicaid, where we're the highest for primary care, um, you know, I wonder if out-of-state care for some of the other services might skew that number because you also said we don't have, I believe, out of state is not in there. So so let's say someone went for some really high end um, care out of state um, and yeah. did their primary care at home. Would that sway that number? Too? No, we did not exclude out of state. There okay. was discussion about excluding it. Uh, someone from one of the states had concerns about if people were considering legislation you couldn't really impact out-of-state providers. But for this study, we never excluded out-of-state. OK, perfect. I, I misinterpreted that. Um, and then the last is you talked about, you know, for PMPM, obviously the mix of what the practice has, if they have older people versus younger, you know, that would skew that. And I just wonder whether you know if any states, if they have the capability to, to do their PMPMs at that level. Because I think that may be more of the concern, right? I, I get the concept that if I'm a practice and I have a lot of older population versus younger, you know, whether most states are going to that level if you're working with an ACO to distribute the funds. So there are, yes. So um, in the development of the PMPM, particularly capitated payments for practices, um, there are risk adjustment methodologies that take into consideration gender, age of the, you know, the, the members in the practice. And it also risk adjusts for um, more comorbidities. So, uh, so there are ways of doing that. And I, I just thought, you know, when you look at these numbers, it's pretty obvious that age is a pretty significant factor. Uh, when you're looking at these practices. And, yeah. and this is another area where there's, uh, you know, disagreement about the best way to approach this. But, um, but yes, there are, certainly there are ways to create a risk-adjusted um, PMPM for a practice. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Other board members? Yeah, I, I have one question. Um, <clears throat> Again, going back to this 10.1% for um, uh, in Vermont um, for the Medicaid program, um, could that be, I mean, and this, this could be a good thing, but could that be driven by the more generous eligibility um, uh, um, availability here in Vermont? And I'm so I'm, I, I went back and I looked at your um, your member count it was in table three I don't think it was up at all but you know if you look if you look at the Medicaid members in the study um, in Vermont relative to the total members that were in the study it's 32.6 percent but you go to Rhode Island and um, their Medicaid membership versus total membership is 24.6 percent and you go to New Hampshire and their membership um, Medicaid membership to total membership is 15.1 percent. Right. So, yeah. so it, it would seem logical that the Medicaid number would be higher relative to these other states, 
and that possibly the commercial is lower because we have programs here that, um, uh, like Dr. Dinosaur, that um, uh, kind of step into the breach. So yes, Vermont is more generous uh, in terms of Medicaid or has a higher Medicaid count, but um, that's not necessarily something to um, you know, compared to commercial because that that's a part of the market that they don't get. Um, so I'm just wondering about that, that um, the, the, the membership here was, you know, skewed pretty favorably toward Vermont in terms of, of um, uh, achieving a Medicaid, the higher Medicaid number based on membership. So uh, Carl, do you want to you want to take a stab at that or do you want me to you well i guess i'll just reiterate this was a descriptive study um so we didn't get into trying evaluating causes of variation um i think everything you've said is probably astute and uh <laughs> would be uh amongst the many factors to explore further um in terms of these variations um so, yeah, I, I think the one thing I would note, uh, that was Tom, is that correct? Um, who asked the question, I think? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure the number of enrolled, enrolled members in Medicaid, I, I don't know if that would make a difference because we're looking at the percent of, um, so the 10.1% is saying that, uh, the primary care spend relative to total Medicaid spend was 10.1%. Um, so it, it does indicate that they're getting more primary care services, I think, or that your Medicaid payment, uh, the allowed amounts are higher. Um, so I think it certainly is worthy of looking deeper into that, but I'm not sure it's entirely related to the number of members in, in, in the Medicaid enrollment. Um, that would be my kind of uh, sense of that. But again, I, I think it, you've raised the right questions. I just don't, I don't know that it's necessarily related to the membership. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, it, it is an unknown and, and the, the entire report has a lot of qualifications to it. And it just seems to me almost a miracle that you got six states almost in the same boat at, at, at one point in time. But, you know, that, that did jump out to me as a significant yeah. difference among states. Um, you know, uh, that New Hampshire, in terms of the membership, uh, and, and these are claims driven, you know, it's not eligibility from, you know, people that were uh, enrolled in Medicaid but had no claims. I, as I understand right. it, these, right. are, these are people who actually had claims. And uh, but Vermont, you would expect Vermont to profile higher there because I think we have programs, uh, you know, that that are are like Dr. Dinosaur that are, um, you know, provide easier access to primary care for people in Medicaid. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, looking at it, I would think you should be happy to see that number. I mean, oh, I am happy to see it. That's you know, it. I, I, when I was finance commissioner under Dr. Dean, we expanded Dr. Dinosaur significantly. It, it was a Madeline Kunin program, but um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm kind of looking at this as the result that we were hoping for. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? Uh, Hi. Go ahead, Robin. Okay. Um, this is Robin. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, but before I ask them, I would just also note on the Medicaid question that um, Vermont has increased its Medicaid primary care reimbursement to Medicare levels, which obviously will have an impact. Although who knows how that those two definitions compare your report definition to what the reimbursement increase was targeted at. Um, um, I had one, a couple of questions about um, some of the data. So on the commercial slide on non-claims payments, I was curious if the unknown category um, reflected the commercial payments to 
community health teams, or do we do we know what that is? Um, yeah, if you could, go, I think it's if you could go to one more slide, um, or one. no, I guess it's one up, one up. I think. Yeah. Nope. It's one. the one that lists. Right. The payments. The payments. There, there you go. Yeah. yeah the five point eight. <clears throat> right. Um, so the, what we did, I mean, so we got these payments and we had this template and the template was, uh, not the number, you know, the, the, the payers told us how much money they spent, but they didn't, the way they categorized the payments was very inconsistent. And so we went back to the, actually the analysts in the States and said, you know, where do you think these payments went? So if it was a P, if it was a PCMH payment, they were pretty well assured that those payments went to a primary care practice, right? Uh, uh, Richard, this is Michelle. I can I can take this one if you want me to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I worked with the uh, payers, Robin, on getting this data. We use a very similar template through our total cost of care reporting to get this data from our payers. So that's just kind of what we stuck with for the purposes of this report. Um, so from our commercial payers specifically here for non-claims payments, you would be looking at CHT and PCMH payments only because we can pretty firmly say those are primary care based payments. Um, in terms of the unknown non-claims payments where you're seeing about $6 million, um, that's very likely an underestimate. So if you recall in the Act 17 report, we had the dollars that we could quantify, but in addition, we had sort of this outstanding appendix of, hey, we know all of these other dollars exist in the state of Vermont system, but we don't, act, we can't say with certainty sort of how they are distributed. So if you were to take all of the additional funds, for example, the 330 funds for clinics for the uninsured, um, if you were to add all of that, that about 6 million number would be closer to like 25 or $30 million. Um, this was just what we could say, you know, uh, uh, whether this was, you know, risk-based payments or things like that, we, we kind of know the set dollar amount, but in terms of if you were to really look at a full bucket of unknown non-claims, that would be much larger. Thanks, Michelle. That's helpful. Um, and uh, in terms of the reporting recommendation, um, if I understood it correctly, the reporting comes from the payers, right? So you're asking the payers to report the non-claims payments that they make out to providers or presumably to the ACO. But the piece that that might miss would be any redistribution of dollars at the ACO level. Am I thinking about that right? Well, at the ACO level, it, yes, or yes, that's one way. And then some of these payments are made in other states are made directly. Now, remember, these are commercial payments that were, yeah. Um, yeah. they're made to the hospitals or health systems. Um, and, right. you know, we don't, there's no, there isn't any uh, request for the, you know, for the payer or the hospital or health system to say specifically where those monies went. Um, Got it. So okay, that, yeah. yeah. So Robin, for this, um, this wouldn't include for a concrete example, this does not include value-based incentive fund dollars, for example, that flow through the ACO or our withhold of their quality programs. Um, we know they have a distribution model of the percentage of that that goes back to primary care. That's not included here since the analysis for this report was um, 2018 specifically, I believe, and that value-based incentive fund has shifted throughout the year. So just trying to, um, you know, something that we ultimately want to incorporate as represented here, but not something we could do in time for this report. Sure. And the the example I had been thinking of was the primary care capitation, where there's additional dollars that flow to primary care who choose to move into that capitated approach, but those dollars are coming out of like hospital dues, for example. Yeah, so I do not believe those are captured here, but right, Lindsay yeah. might. <laughs> okay. I mean, I didn't expect them to. I was just trying to think it through. So that was helpful. Um, 
the CPR program is also not included here. I should add that too. Yeah. For yeah. purposes of the ACO. Yep. Cool. Okay. Those were my uh, two burning questions. Thank you. Super. Yes. I just have two. Um, one, I think Richard, well, thank you very much for the presentation and Michelle and everybody, Lindsay, Carl, who worked on this. Um, uh, Richard, you mentioned at the end a comment about obviously there's no right number um, and the New England states are showing a six to eight percent roughly primary spend on primary care, but you were, you reflected on other countries and I'm just wondering in your research for preparing for this presentation and this report, can you just give us a ballpark of what, for example, Europe would spend? I know that's often commented on the difference and certainly there's the proportion of primary care doctors in Europe is much higher relative to the US. I'm just wondering as a benchmark or a ballpark, what, what does Europe look like? So I actually, I looked that up yesterday. I thought <laughs> you had asked that. <laughs> <laughs> you know um, me too. <laughs> um, it, it looks like it's in the 12 to 14 percent um, in the European countries. But again, I'm not sure what's included in that definition. You know, so we don't know who the providers are, what the services are, et cetera. So it would, you'd have to dig a little deeper, but it looks like it's in that ballpark, around okay. 80%. Great. That's what I was thinking, but I wasn't sure if that was just a, yeah. you know. Yeah. And again, it's true. What's in the bucket is important. Right. Um, and my second quick question just is, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of this conversation has been around the percent of the primary care, comparing the percent of primary care spend by payer across states. And I'm just wondering if you have any conclusions or any uh, thoughts on when a comparison of the per member, the PMPM by payer across states. So I saw like, for example, in one of the charts there, you had the variation, for example, on definition two of Medicaid, the low was 22 in some state and the high was 47 in another state. Right. Uh, commercial was 34 and 51. In these, in the presentation, you didn't break it out by state, but I'm wondering in your analysis, um, so yeah, what can we learn from the variation in PMPM across states by pair? Um, so for commercial, the variation is from in definition one, uh, 23 to 31 dollars. This is all payers, all pay or no commercial. I'm sorry, commercial, and then um, in. Uh, Definition two was thirty-four dollars to fifty-one dollars. Um, yeah, so there's significant variation. I mean, one one state was a little higher, and they were questioning the data for their state. So, excluding them, I mean, even then, there's there's variation on Medicare Advantage from thirty-two to thirty-six um, in definition one from on Medicare fee for service from twenty-five to 32, and then, and this will be in the appendix, by the way. Um, it's not in right now, but we're going to be adding that into the appendix. So you're gonna add in by state. So we'll by be able to see, for example, where does Vermont fall yeah. in the PMPM by each pair? Yes. Okay, that'll be really helpful to understand. Thank yeah. you. Um, I can give you a spoiler. We are I right in line. I always <laughs> read the last page of a book first, so tell me. Nice. Uh, one of my professors in college used to take all of her like extra credit questions from footnotes. So I still to this day always read footnotes. Um, so uh, the we are for PMPM purposes um, with the so for commercial, I would say we are actually like right in line with Rhode Island. So when people often compare to Rhode Island on a percentage basis, we look we look lower. But when you look at it by a PMPM, we're actually um, Pretty close and the differences are as Richard's saying they are pretty significant as you go like from the bottom to the top but they're not all that different so um, it's just really interesting I agree Jess that was one of my favorite parts of the report so when I heard that it might be removed I, I fought for it so that's why it's in the appendix yeah, <laughs> thank I'm you for writing because I'm very curious to see it so when it's ready I would love to please share it with me that'll yeah. be in the yeah. next uh, next revision of the report so and, and give credit to Michelle for fighting for that one. Um, <laughs> Thank so, you. So she did get that in. And, uh, you know, I think it was important to put that in also. Uh, Richard, can I make one comment on the uh, 
on the range of variation. The, um, so as part of this project, we evaluated a lot of other studies that had previously been done. And there's, there's an appendix in the final report that shows the range of variation that some of these studies have shown. And for the NESCO project, the range of variation between the six states is either similar or much lower than the variability shown in some of these other studies. For example, Oregon did a study and, and the range of variation between the payers there is, is huge uh, in terms of um, uh, these kind of results. So just wanted to point that out. Can I also just ask a question, sorry, Jess's question reminded me of another question I had related to the comparison between like definition one and definition two, where you included a broader range. Um, I know like in some states, there will be a primary care office that will have like embedded uh, medical technology like MRIs or x-rays or things like that. So would those sorts of labs or those kinds of services that were in the primary care office potentially explain some of that variation between definition one and definition two? I'm just curious about like what kinds of things are in definition two. Yeah, I think anything that any of those providers build for uh, would any service they build for would be in definition two. So, um, so that, yes, those are the types of services that would probably be included. And I, I think it, that's one of the suggestions is that we, um, you know, if we're going to continue to do these reports, that if the next one, we would have a better sense of the impact, which services have the greatest impact in increasing that percentage um, that are included in definition two. I just want to comment on the use of the word primary care office. Um, so one of the things we did state and we know is that in claims data, there's no field to identify primary care setting. So knowing that something was done in a primary care office cannot be done. We use provider taxonomy codes to identify the particular types of primary care specialist for this project. But we actually can't say <laughs> for certain that this or that was done in a primary care officer setting. For example, if someone got a colonoscopy and for whatever reason, the provider on that was identified in our taxonomy codes, that might end up as a small part of definition two. Um, so. Got it, thank you for that clarification, that's helpful. Anything else from any board members? If not, we're going to open it up for the public, for public comment. Um, does any member of the public wish to comment? Hearing none, um, Richard, Carl, is fascinating uh, um, report. Um, we look forward to delving into those appendices a little bit uh, further and um, Thank you so much. Uh, we know this has been a, a long project and we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry you couldn't see me. I put on a nice shirt and everything for you today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have to believe you. <laughs> Thanks for the time. We appreciate the opportunity to present it to you. So. No problem. With that, I'm going to recess the meeting until one o'clock this afternoon when we will resume with a panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.